there are two types of um, particles in nature called bosons and fermions. So um, in quantum physics, all particles have spin. You can think of this as just the rotation of an object around its own axis, just as the Earth rotates on its own axis and gives rise to day and night. So in quantum physics, there's a um, related notion and that goes by the name of spin, except in quantum physics, spin is fixed to be a particular value. So each particle has spin, but that spin is fixed. And it can only be either an integer, so 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. And these particles are called bosons. Or spin uh, can be half integer, so half, three halves, five halves, and so on. And these particles are called fermions. So just the fact that one particle has integer spin and another has half integer spin completely changes the properties of these particles. So for example, fermions, uh, two fermions with the same uh, quantum properties can't lie in the same uh, space and at the same point in space, whereas bosons can. So um, a lot of the properties of a particle can just simply be deduced by the fact that whether they're bosons or, or, or fermions. To give an example of some bosons, for example, the Higgs boson uh, has spin zero, or for example, the photon, the, the particle that mediates the force of electricity and magnetism, photons are what our eyes receive from light, that has spin 1, it's also a boson. Um, the mediator of gravity, the graviton, has spin 2. So these are all bosons. But most of the particles in nature are in fact fermions. Most of what we're made of, up of and what matter is made up of are fermions. Uh, for example, the electron has been uh, half, or uh, quarks, which form protons and uh, nuclei in the atom. These also have spin half. So we have this imbalanced picture whereby we have a certain type of particles called bosons, and with the exception of the Higgs boson, these are all mediators of forces, electricity and magnetism or electromagnetism, the weak and strong nuclear forces and gravity. And then on the other hand, we have these fermions that are what matter is composed of, our electrons and our quarks. So um, supersymmetry is a proposal, is a theory that wants to rectify this imbalance. And the way it does this is precisely by relating bosons and fermions. In, in a supersymmetric theory or in the theory of supersymmetry, each particle has a partner, a twin. And if the original particle is a fermion, for example, an electron, it has a boson partner. And this is true for all of the particles. So in some sense, supersymmetry restores this imbalance between um, the fermions and the bosons that exist in nature. And there are many motivations, particle physics motivation for doing this. There are various problems that supersymmetry aims to solve. And in fact, supersymmetry is being searched for in the LHC at CERN at the moment. And if it's discovered, it would be a very revolutionary event in, in theoretical physics. So that's supersymmetry, but I haven't talked about gravity yet. This is just the particles that um, we're all made of and the forces that interact between these particles. We know that 
there's also gravity. So we somehow have to combine this theory of supersymmetry with gravity. And the theory that combines these two is called supergravity. So supergravity is a theory where we also include gravity and all of the other particles. And again, each particle has its partner. So, the gravi so in gravity, for example, we have the graviton and in supergravity, we have the partner of the graviton, which is now a fermion, whereas graviton itself is a boson. So gravity is, a hi uh, sorry, supergravity is a highly symmetric theory because of this link and relation between these various types of particles. And it's highly constrained for that reason. In fact, there's a particular dimension above which there is no supergravity theory. We can't write down any supergravity theory. That's how highly constrained the theory is. That dimension is 11. So 10 spatial dimensions plus one time di um, dimension. At 11, in 11 dimensions, the theory that we have, the supergravity theory we have is in fact unique. And theoretical physicists love um, whenever there's a unique theory that's extremely beautiful for them because everything is constrained. There are no more parameters. You can't dial or tune. The theory is given and you, you have to understand that theory. So this is extremely beautiful. But the problem is that the world that we live in is four dimensional free spatial dimensions, up, down, left, right, forward, backward, and plus time is an extra dimension. In 11 dimensions, we have a unique supergravity theory. This is extremely beautiful, but it lives in seven higher dimensions. Um, now, in fact, this, is, this can also be viewed as, the adva as an advantage of the theory. Um, in a sense that I'll explain shortly. But the, another reason why um, the existence of supergravity, a unique theory of supergravity in 11 dimensions is significant is because it's related to string theory and M theory. So string theory is a proposal whereby point-like particles are replaced by strings and different vibrations of the string give rise to the different particles in nature. Now, in fact, string theories are also generally supersymmetric. The consistent ones are supersymmetric, and string theories have to live in 10 dimensions. But we have, so we have all of these string theories in 10 dimensions, but there's a proposal that there's a unique theory called M theory in 11 dimension, which gives rise to all of these string theories in one lower dimension. So this mother theory, this M theory, is um, significant for giving rise to all of these theories of string theory, but we know very little about M theory. In fact, one of the few things that we do know about M theory is what it looks like at low energies. So if we um, look at the very small energies or long distances, we know that M theory is described by precisely this unique 11 dimensional supergravity that I talked about. So whether we're looking at supergravity or M theory, we have the problem of going from 11 dimensions to four dimensions. And this problem is called, uh, the, the solution to this problem is Kluze-Klein theory. So the original idea of um, Klein and uh, Kluze was to unify gravity and electricity and magnetism by going one dimension higher to five dimensions. This is a, extremely beautiful idea because we take two very different things, gravity 
the force that acts on all objects and pulls them uh, towards each other and the electricity and magnetism which has no obvious relation to gravity and they can unify these in a single description by just going to five dimensions. So in a sense one can think of kaluza klein theory as simplifying complexity by going to higher dimension. And this is why I said that, in fact, the existence of a unique supergravity in a higher dimension can be thought of as an advantage because we know that the world is complicated. There are all sorts of various interactions and many different parameters to tune the strength of all of these interactions. So there's no way of writing down a single theory that describes all of these and is unique. But if we go to a higher dimension, we do have unique theories. And how do we um, sort of square the circle? How do we make this a consistent picture whereby we have a simple unique theory and a complicated world? Well, that's where Kaluza Klein comes in. All that complexity is encoded in those internal dimensions, those extra dimensions. It's encoded in how we get from the higher dimensions to the lower dimensions. So, for example, in supergravity, there are various manifolds, there are various spaces on which one can reduce and there are various experimental and observational constraints for these extra dimensions to be small. And this is um, an area of study in string theory in trying to relate string theory to, to nature. In supergravity, one can consider this question in a much more, in a sort of toy model. In supergravity, this question can be treated as a toy example because in supergravity, which is the low energy limit of string theory, these questions are easier to answer. So um, one can really take these supergravity theories in 11 or high dimensions and do a Kluze Klein reduction down to four dimension and try and see um, what sort of theories one can obtain in that way.